Good evening, everyone, and I'm truly delighted to welcome Asa Briggs and Ian McEwen to the Charleston Festival. Asa Briggs is one of the most eminent and influential social and cultural historians of our time, a man of many parts, undeniably great and indisputably good. He's held, <laughs> he's held several prestigious <coughs> uh, academic posts in the UK and the US. He's the author of Victorian People, Victorian Cities and Victorian Things, as well as a five volume history of broadcasting in the UK, essentially a biography of the BBC. He was made a life peer in 1976. Asa's recent book, Secret Days, described his time as a code breaker in Bletchley Park, alongside figures such as Alan Turing, whose centenary it is this year. His current book, Special Relationships, is a candid and typically modest memoir, looking back across his personal and professional life and detailing his many fascinating friendships and encounters, as well as his numerous interests, most importantly, music and literature. But undoubtedly, the most significant aspect of Asa Briggs's distinguished career is his involvement with the University of Sussex during its formative years. Professor of History and Pro-Vice-Chancellor from the university's inception and Vice-Chancellor from 1967 to 1976. Glorious as well as turbulent times. And as it happens, Quentin Bell, who grew up in this house, was Professor of the History of Art at Sussex during that period. Now this neatly brings me to Ian McEwen, who is the product of Sussex University, at least in terms of formal education, during Asa Briggs's period of office. Although I gather this is their first tete-a-tete -tete encounter, which is slightly surprising given the common practice of students to hobnob with vice-chancellors. <laughs> Um, and I also have to say that um, it's never worked out for Ian to come and talk about one of his own books here for one reason or the other. But when I suggested to him that perhaps he might like to come tonight uh, um, and talk to Asa, he leapt at the chance. So I think, I think that's very telling of Ian and of Asa. Ian McEwan's fiction encompasses numerous award-winning short stories and novels, from his first collection, First Love, Last Rites, to the Booker Award-winning Amsterdam, Atonement, which was also made into a film, Saturday, On Chesil Beach, and most recently, Solar, a, portray a portrayal of the current state of climate research and a wickedly accurate satire on the foibles of scientists. Apart from the relevance of the University of Sussex in both their lives, Asa and Ian have other things in common. Early in his career, Ian wrote The Imitation Game, in a play, inspired by the great mathematician Alan Turing. His forthcoming novel, Sweet Tooth, revisits his interest in deception, and rumour has it, Asa Briggs and the University of Sussex even make an appearance. The University of Sussex is also a very important link as far as Charleston is concerned, and we're very grateful for its sponsorship of tonight's event. I have it on good authority that the current Vice-Chancellor, Michael Farthing, is following in Asa Briggs's footsteps and is providing over an equally glorious as well as tumultuous period. So I'd like to thank uh, and welcome Azen Ian, and also to thank the University of Sussex and particularly Michael Farthing. Well, uh, good evening. It's rather disconcerting and, and also rather exciting to finally meet the man who, uh, and I mean this really, uh, is partly responsible for arranging the furniture of, of my own mind. And if our conversation is a dud, um, you'll know who to blame. <laughs> <laughs> the University of Sussex really was uh, an extraordinary experience for me in 1967 when I went there. Uh, Asa was in the Empyrean Heights. Uh, I don't think I came close to meeting a vice chancellor for many, many years. But uh, reading special relationships, uh, 
I began to understand why I knew some of the things I knew. Um, point one, all students of humanities were required, before they even got down to their proper business of their specialism, to understand something about the most important subject of all, not even history, but historiography. That is to say, we were required to read Turner's thesis of the expansion of the West, Burkhardt's civilization of the Renaissance, and Tawney's uh, religion and the rise of capitalism. And those books have stayed with me, and thank you very much for that. <laughs> but as a student of English literature, I was able to study international relations with Peter Calvert Caressi, who was a lawyer at Nuremberg, and, but also was at Bletchley, um, art history with Quentin Bell, Quantum Mechanics for Liberal Arts Know-Nothings um, with uh, a scientist called Brian Easley and, and many other subjects. So at some point we will get to the connection between Bletchley and the University of Sussex because uh, we've touched on this in a, a, a supper time conversation just uh, flagging it up. These two institutions have something in common. But Asa, I, as a historian, you, you say this very boldly and clearly. You are interested in chronology. And may we start at the beginning with Keith Lee. You are a Yorkshireman. Uh, you are a grammar school boy to the core. And you went up to Cambridge in 1938. But can we just have a flavor of your rather intellectual teenage years? You were... <coughs> Well, it was, a, it was a very old grammar school uh, which had been forced to adapt itself in the course of the 19th century into something more than a grammar school. It was particularly interested. It was the only school in the country, I think, which became called a trade and grammar school. Uh, it's very unusual. Uh, it was a good school to be at. I was taught well. Uh, I was aware of the limitations of grammar school education as well as its strengths. Uh, but it was certainly a school without any particular class basis. People went to the grammar school in Keithley uh, from totally different social classes and only those who felt some kind of uh, social superiority, and there were not many of them in Keithley, went to Giggleswick or some other institution of a public school type. You're one of those writers who has uh, an English teacher in your background, yes. as well as, in fact, you're, you're a bit privileged because you've got a, a headmaster and an English teacher who were powerful intellectual influences. Well, I had a, a headmaster who taught scripture as if, as if it was the thought of Jeremy Bentham and nothing yes. else. <laughs> and he used to twiddle his gown behind him uh, and he talked about Bentham, and I learnt about Bentham when I was at school. Uh, but uh, my English master was superb. I was forced in English to read far more books now, then, than people would read pretty degree today in English. And he really uh, would never give you more than six marks out of ten uh, for any essay that you wrote. He also insisted, he was a, a, a very remarkable teacher. He didn't get on well with the Benthamite headmaster. Uh, but as a teacher, he uh, insisted that um, you should study texts critically. And if you used to write them what was called a context paper, uh, if you didn't get it right, who actually where the context came from, you got no marks at all. <laughs> so I felt very lucky at school uh, to get uh, more than about 45% and I was still the top of the class. <laughs> uh, it was a very, very interesting experience. It was a good school, but it had its weaknesses. Uh, when, I, when I'd been at Bletchley, or when I was waiting to go to Bletchley, I taught for a time in what was then called a secondary modern school. And the headmaster there was a man of far more creative power than my own Benthamite headmaster. 
and he had one daughter who was appearing on the stage in London, a uh, very attractive daughter. He also uh, was a man who was interested in the creative arts. And uh, if you put the two men together on a platform, as we're sitting here tonight, I think it would be the headmaster of the comprehensive school. Mm. Uh, it wasn't a comprehensive, they were not called yeah. that, secondary modern. It would have he it would have come out the better, I think. Would you? So looking back, um, do you think of grammar schools as the engine of social mobility, or was it a device that consigned three quarters of the population to secondary modern? No, they were they were a device of social mobility, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to say that um, there was one scheme which the government then introduced, which was, to my mind, the key to social mobility the state scholarship scheme. And from pe different parts of the country, uh, you would take a state scholarship. You had to be interested in going to a university. You had to be very clever at the time. Uh, and uh, at that stage, I didn't really feel too many intellectual obstacles in the way. Uh, the state scholarship scheme was one of the things we abandoned at our loss. Yes. Uh, and I would like to see now a state scholarship scheme introduced for very old people like myself <laughs> who never expect to live to this age to see what still makes us tick yes. in our 90s. Uh, I think this will be a very, very interesting medical social experiment. <laughs> but you got talked out of doing English and talked into doing history. Yes. And it's extraordinary how... For so many of us who remember their A-levels, that we stand at, like in a garden of forking paths at the age of 16 and our fate unfolds because we didn't do science or we yes, did yes. history and not English or French and not German. Well, everybody, everybody wanted me to do chemistry. Uh, it was my best subject. Uh, and indeed, I got better marks in chemistry than any other subject. And if I had been brought up now, I would be forced to go to a university and do science subjects, I think. Uh, but in fact, uh, I knew perfectly well that I would never really make something that I would call a really great scientist. And I did feel, as a young boy, that I could probably make myself into a good historian. Not necessarily a great historian, but mm. somebody who could r write history in an original fashion. And uh, that uh, may, became the subject because of my headmaster and a very, very good uh, 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 teacher of history, not anywhere near as good as a teacher of literature. Uh, between them, they were very good for me. But you got talked out of English literature. Let me, let me just quote, you, you very much approve of the German historian Wilhelm Dilthe. Yes. And you, the, the progressive identification with the mental and emotional lives of others creates higher levels of self-awareness than unaided self-examination. Now, as soon as I read the lives of others, I don't just think of that wonderful German movie, but I think of the act of reading a novel, yes. uh, which clearly has uh, been very important to you throughout your life, that literature, novels and poetry have remained very important to you. You could easily have gone up to Cambridge and done English. Yes, I, my headmaster wouldn't allow me to go <laughs> to mm. read English. He, he, he was a formidable figure, very good headmaster. He taught my mother and father really what universities were about, and they knew nothing. We, we sometimes think mm. in the in light of our present experience, I've been so deeply involved with the Open University that we all know what universities are. Very few people in 1937 and 38 knew what universities were. Very few members of their families had been to one. I was the first person in my family to go to university. My wife was the first member of her family to go to university. We came from totally different backgrounds. Now we all know something about universities. And I do have what I regard as a high conception of a university. I think a university should be there for people who really do want to go to university, who do want to get something special out of the experience.
and uh, in that sense, uh, I have learned through life and through the Open University how important it is to give people the feeling that a university education is something special. And that's why I use the word special relationship, one of the reasons why I use the word special relationships in my new book. But you're not presumably echoing Kingsley Amos's more is less. No, no. I disagree with that entirely. Yeah. Uh, I've always believed in access to higher education, but not for people who don't want to do it. And also, I've never felt particularly uh, that there's any reason why, on paper, I look totally Oxbridge. I was at Cambridge, and then I taught in Oxford for a lot of my life. Uh, but I do, don't believe that it is necessary to go to Oxford or Cambridge to get a good university education. Uh, and I think that I attach most importance to the quality of higher education uh, in present circumstances. Have we become, I mean, we've, we've slipped out of chronology for a moment, which I hope we would too. Yeah. Um, have we become a little too grad grindian and utilitarian in our notion of uh, the university now too, too fixed on what business interests or mercantile interests might be? I, I, I think that we, in our universities at the moment, there's not enough creative thinking. Uh, when I was vice chancellor of Sussex, uh, we had the chance of starting a new university. And when I was involved in the planning of the Open University, we would do some, something radical and new. Uh, but I wouldn't have felt then uh, that uh, we should just follow in other people's patterns. I'm very non-derivative. Uh, I'm very anxious to follow my own ways through. And if I was still involved in uh, university education now, and I'm very glad that this is being sponsored by the University of Sussex this evening, and Michael and I talk about this. I'm very glad to feel that you can show some originality in the way in which you approach questions of what university education is. And unless vice chancellors have got something to say about that, which is worthwhile, mm. then we shall get nowhere. We're just copying each other, and we will find ourselves in a worse educational system possibly than I ever expected they would ever live in. When you so you went to Sydney, Sussex, uh, Cambridge, 1938, uh, for my generation, so I'm the generation of your sons, as it were, you're my father's generation, um, 1938 speaks only of the, of the shadow of war. Yes. Uh, you took advice, uh, which was get your degree and then fight this war. Well, I was given very, very good advice in Cambridge by the man who took me. Uh, in 1937, when I took my scholarship examination for Cambridge, uh, he was a very remarkable man. Uh, and he said to me in Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, he said, uh, there's going to be a war. And I would like you to be able to take your degree before you put on uniform wonderful advice and then he said you're only a baby Asa. Uh, but uh, I'm going to take you notwithstanding and you'll get your degree before you put on uniform and he was right and I managed to take my degree uh, before uh, I went into the army and by taking my degree then I was undoubtedly placed at a considerable advantage as compared with people who had to go back after the end of the war mm. and do their degrees in those circumstances. And they were most of the people I knew best in the college. Uh, the other thing about uh, uh, the, the history tutor who took me on was that he was in already in some way involved in intelligence. He became the, uh, uh, in, indeed, the uh, head of the... Uh, in the, of the service writing up the intelligence histories at the end of the war. And so Jim Passant, I owe an immense amount of debt to him. I don't think of him now in terms of all this advice, but we used to go and play charades yeah. in his house with the children 
at Christmas. I had a wonderful set of old clothes there, and I kept in touch with him for the rest of my life. And uh, I've never been particularly good at playing charades, uh, <laughs> but we, went, we, we, anyway, we enjoyed them. In '38, was the, it was the general atmosphere at a university um, a sort of stoical sense that you were heading towards something inevitable by this point? Very left-wing, Cambridge was in those days. The spies were just behind us. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I never actually met uh, many of them uh, personally because I was just that there, that there was a big difference between every year in Cambridge in the way to the war. But I did know Anthony Blunt uh, and uh, I met later on Blunt is with the court hall and also uh, I have decided that because of the range of the people that I'd known, that I that would write my second book on uh, on on the, uh, the what has happened since the other 88 years of my life when I was not at Bletchley. But you were maybe just a little too young to be a 30s Marxist. I was not a Marxist. No, I've never been a Marxist. But you read Marx in your oh, late I read teens. Marx, and mm. indeed. Uh, I think Marx is a very interesting writer to read, uh, but I've never been a Marxist. Uh, I've always been a very autonomous, independent-minded historian. Uh, I've had to get on well with Marxists through my life. Uh, I've also got on very well with people who are totally different. Uh, Cambridge in those days was undoubtedly, even in 1938 to 39, very, very left-wing Marxist uh, in its general orientation, uh, far more than any other university <coughs> institution with which I've been involved since. So you must have been at Cambridge at the news of the Nazi Soviet Yes, pact. indeed. So yes. that must have changed things around you. It didn't you. change things as much as you would have thought. Really? Uh, I think that the Nazi Soviet pact, which I first of all heard about, in the town hall square in Keithley, in my hometown. Uh, and then I thought, this is a big change. But in point of fact, uh, everybody knew then we were going to war. And uh, I knew perfectly well, because I thought it, I'd be in uniform earlier than I was. Uh, but um, the Nazi Soviet pact was one of those terrible things like Hungary, which really shattered people's illusions. Mm. And I've always been a combination of a rather imaginative historian and a realistic historian. And I believe that I'm been ta I was taught by realist people in Cambridge like E.H. Carr and so on, who subsequently turned out to be more pro-communist than they yes. <laughs> sometimes said to be. But it was a very, very, it was a fascinating time. I think you have to be born at the right time. And I was born in 1921, so I've more or less a parallel my life to the history of the BBC. Uh, and I uh, went on living to a far more advanced, I never expected to reach this age. And now I have to confront a very, very different world from the world which I was thinking about when I was a young man. Is it better? No. Not necessarily. I think we're living through a particularly unfortunate time when none of our politicians are really interested in history at all. Mm. We've never been in a time when the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the Leader of the Opposition know nothing whatsoever about mm. history. <laughs> uh, and I find this is very disturbing. Uh, and we should all be disturbed by it. Uh, there are people who do know about history, it doesn't necessarily make them better politicians. But they should have some sense of perspective and some sense of drawing on past experience and not thinking that two situations are the same because all situations in history are different. I'm trying to think of the politicians who knew they, Michael Foote knew his history. Mark Michael Foote was interested in history. Enoch uh, Powell. Jim Callaghan was interested in history. Uh, Harold mm. Macmillan, in yes. particular, yes. was the man who really... I could, I could have a really serious conversation with Harold Macmillan about history. 
So it, uh, it, you must feel then it would make you a better politician in some respect to know your... Uh, not necessarily. No. I can think of politicians. I think that it, it's essential to have a sense of the future as well as of the past. Uh, and I've just been... I've been just as much interested in my own writing, and there's a lot about it in this new book, in, in the, the future as in the past. Yeah. And uh, you, I see history as being a continuum, uh, past, present, and future. And I do believe that uh, unless you have a sense of the future, you will get nowhere in politics. So is that what we're lacking? among our No, I think that there is a, a vague sense of the future. Mm. But unfortunately, they're not much more clear about what the future will be than they are about what the past was. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trapped in the present. <laughs> um, maybe it's just a sense of helplessness in, in, in the face of events. They just don't seem to um, have a sense that they can control them. I mean, Europe, no. the, the European project now which we... Europe is, I mean, Europe has gone totally different from what people expected it as it were to be. I've been looking at uh, past newspapers a good deal and thinking about what I would say tonight. I've got a very good collection of private archives and uh, I've so, shown one to my wife, which I found yesterday, which said why we should join the Euro at once. Yes. Uh, and it now looks to be slightly silly. Uh, the, uh, you've got to have some kind of grasp of what are the different elements in a historical situation, including our own contemporary uh, situation, which really will help us to foresee outcomes. Uh, and uh, I end my book, the second of my books, with trees and how important trees are because Trees can grow from acorns into big trees, and they can also die. And therefore, it's very, very important to have natural history in the old-fashioned sense of the word in your mind, as well as human history. When you're dealing with this material as a historian and thinking of how you might, say, write the history of now, yes. 20 years hence, and I hope you will, um, you quote, again, with some approval, uh, a rather lovely little paragraph of, of Jacob Burkhardt about how a different historian with the same material yes. on his lap, in his hands on his desk, would come up with different conclusions. Yeah. And it's that sense of history as a, a venture, an adventure. I do admire Burkhardt immensely, and that's one of the reasons why I've never been tempted to be a Marxist. I think that there are options... <coughs> alternatives and uh, diversities and to me uh, Burkhardt brings together cultural history and political and social history in a very interesting way mm. and uh, I regard him as being quite a major influence on my own life. There's quite a lot of humility in that. A lot of humility. Uh, I, don't like, I don't like pride. When I was asked in Oxford as head of a college uh, to give a sermon. There's sermons given every year on humility and pride. And that year, it was pride, and I'd rather have talked about humility. <laughs> I was also given a set of texts uh, to, in Oxford fashion, uh, which didn't really help me too much to write what I was going to say in the sermon. Uh, and uh, I found that uh, I was stood in... This, in St. Mary's, that great church in Oxford, uh, where Newman and many other people had been. And uh, there I wanted to talk about pride in a very different way from that in which the texts were leading me. But I had to stick to the text. And the text was humility. It was not pride. Yeah. It was pride.
Um, can we return to our chronology? Uh, so you finish your degree, you rapidly acquire another one in economics, um, popped back up north to do some teaching, but let's scoot ahead to, you join the uh, signals regiment, Yes. Um, learnt Morse code. Yes. Um, I admired you for that. I learnt Morse code when I was 10, because my father said, you get nowhere without Morse code. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I agree with that sentiment. And yeah. I'm still waiting for it to come in handy. Uh, 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 uh. Um, and then found yourself inducted into what now, from this perspective, seems, uh, well, perhaps the most interesting war yes. a man could have or, uh, or an intellectual could have, for sure. Uh, and you were part of the legendary Hut 6, um, at least as legendary as Hut 3 and Hut 8. Yes. Um, whoever hears of Hut 1 or 2, uh, <laughs> they don't figure. Um, could you give us a flavour of what your daily work consisted of in Hut 6? It was absolutely fascinating. Uh, we were divided into shifts. Oh, and we were also, you, they used naval talk, and I was in the watch. And uh, our work was to try to break the Enigma code. I was a real cryptographer. There's no, a word now not used, it's cryptanalysis now that's always used. But I found that uh, we worked as a team. There were about uh, six, or possibly seven or eight on a watch on one of the ships. And if we had not broken the Enigma code uh, by the time the night shift went off, then we were dissatisfied and worried. Uh, so, Asa, when you say break the code, what's actually in front of you that you've got well, to do? Well, what happened with? is that the Germans changed their codes day by day. Uh, and uh, they also introduced an enormous variety of different codes. Uh, I found that uh, what we had to do was to find a passage uh, which we thought might correspond uh, to the Enigma drafted encrypt of the message. Uh, and we found what we call cribs, cribbages, uh, which were in fact on what, what we based our approach to breaking the code. Uh, so you would have in front of you five letter groups? We have five letter groups uh, in German uh, and the machine had one uh, flaw, if you like, it's, it, which is that it could not use the same letter for the encrypted message which was there in the original message. Right. So therefore, A could not be A. A could be A. And therefore, what we were able to do was to draft what, in a sense, was a sort of computer program. Yeah. Uh, and this program would then go to be played over by uh, people in outstations of Bletchley, mainly women. <coughs> women played a very important part. And incidentally, that was one of the nicest things of moving from Cambridge to Bletchley, mm. because there were more women around. <laughs> um, at, 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 at Bletchley, it was at, at Cambridge, a very, very small number of women. Uh, but in Bletchley, they were in the great majority. And women really won the war, in my, to my mind, in Bletchley. But we worked in teams. Uh, we specialised in one area. I was interested in Yugoslavia. And therefore, I learnt all about Tito and all the things in Yugoslavia. But we had to break codes from any part of the world. So uh, did, did you have enough German to, did it I matter? I had just <laughs> enough German. Yeah. So I, I, I would not describe myself as being a particularly good linguist. But I'm just trying to get your watch in mind. You're in this, yes. in your hut six, you're maybe reading the red code of yes. the, um, or the Luftwaffe code. You break these five letter groups. Um, you explain very uh, clearly in, in a way that only a historian can. I've read loads of books on Bletchley. Yeah. I've never had it explained to me uh, till now. 
not, not only A could never be encoded as A, yes. but if A was encoded as Z, then Z had to be A. Yes. Um, already, and, and also the, the, the operatives, the German operatives were so foolish as to sign off their messages, heavily encoded, with Heil Hitler. Yes. Which, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> or, or even, uh, Heil Hitler, you did have to have a few more words than Heil Hitler, but they used to send silly messages saying, this is an absolute truth. This is a nonsense message. Right. And then they also would put in occasionally the way today's weather. And one way into our message is, well, were the weather forecasts. And since the weather forecasts were sent out by the Germans every day, we relied upon these for a lot of our information. Mm. Uh, we also did get to know, uh, and this is why historians were important at Bletchley, we got to know, or to try to know, what was in the minds of the people who were sending the messages. Uh, you had to be able to get into their minds. And um, it was interesting that a colleague of mine from my own co college very quickly decided that Germans would be, uh, very, some of the operators would be very unlazy, lazy, would be very lazy. And they wouldn't want to change the wheels too much each day, which they were supposed to do. And therefore, you could reduce the, the probabilities yeah. of uh, and, uh, the, the terrible tip as it was called, uh, really was one of the things that helped us to break the code. Because just for those who haven't followed Bletchley material for the last uh, 40 years, the encoding machine was like a typewriter with, yeah. with um, three or four wheels to set, and the settings were different for each day, and various sections of the German war effort had names for their, yes. or, or Bletchley gave names to their particular encoding methods. <laughs> So this brings me back to, again, your love of literature. Yes. And again, hear uh, how this touches on you as the historian, that Bletchley was not packed with crossword puzzle experts and mathematicians yes. alone. There were historians, and historians played this vital role in being able to imagine themselves into the Yes, I think, I think they were very important because, you see, I got to know... For example, in Yugoslavia, people, who, Germans who were sending out messages in Yugoslavia, and I felt I was inside their minds. I'd love to have met them since the war. Just one of them, never seen one. Uh, but um, I knew perfectly well, not only the disposition of the Luftwaffe, of the German Air Force in Yugoslavia, uh, but I did know about the individual operators. And history is a very interesting subject because it forces you to think about the individual and the team or the group. And uh, Bletchley was a superb place. The Germans could not have created Bletchley. Uh, they were too uh, authoritarian and they were also too fractious mm. with each other and they didn't believe in employing women. Mm. And so mm. consequently, they could never have devised Bletchley and Bletchley was a characteristic British invention at its best, where, we, where there was no sense of rank. We were all on equal terms together. Uh, it didn't matter whether you were in the army or a civilian. We could talk to each other on equal terms. And I learned that aspect of life, which I did take with me to Sussex much later on, uh, from, but largely from Bletchley. Because it was an in interdisciplinary Place. It was interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. What happened to your, just to stick with this, your piece of paper, enco uh, decoded, passes through some hatch to someone who analyzes the intelligence? It was a wonderful mm -hmm. geographical setup. There was a hatch where papers came through, uh, the original uh, papers. We also saw the, uh, there was a, a room there called, wonderful name, the Fusion Room. Yes where the fusion room actually managed to, that uh, developed late in the war, uh, where you managed to get people involved in intelligence, working closely with people involved in cryptography. And I was very, very lucky that uh, hut, eight, hut 6 was next to Hut 3, which was the intelligence 
section of Bletchley, which had far more problems than we had in cryptography. But it, there was a door that I could go through myself, yes. uh, from Hut 6 into Hut 3. And I was just as well known to people in Hut 3 as in Hut 6. And after the war, it was people in Hut 3, historians there, yes. that I got to know better than the people who'd been in Hut 6. Tell us a little about the figure that we all associate uh, with Bletchley, Alan Turing. A great man. Uh, it is, in fact, the Turing year. And uh, I never knew Turing well, because Turing had virtually disappeared from being working inside Bletchley uh, uh, by the time I got there. But I did know him. And uh, he was really deeply involved, of course, with his own college, which was King's College, which he loved. And he, he King's College, Cambridge, and he also liked working with the post office. And he went mm. out to Dollis Hill and uh, he did a lot of his best work in the post office. I don't think the contribution of the post office to Bletchley has still been fully enough mm. recognised. When you say the post office, you mean Dollis Hill, which is a the, highly the research, technical... The, um, yeah. uh, the mm. post office mm. was for a time after the end of the war too, a mm. very highly geared research establishment. Mm. It's, we now think of it in terms of the future of the Royal Mail and so mm. on. Then there was a very, very strong research element in the post. Mm. So it's interesting, <coughs> given your <coughs> later interest, the monumental five-volume history of the BBC, but then also your mm. book with Peter Burke, um, History of Communication, that you must have seen the first of those proto-digital machines uh, the bombers and then the yes. Colossus being carried into huts where the doors weren't wide enough for the... Well, the C Colossus <laughs> was, of course, a great achievement. Mm. Uh, but Colossus was not really involved with Enigma at mm. all. Mm. It was breaking new codes which were based essentially on teleprinter systems and not on Morse. Uh, and uh, I admired immensely the people who developed the Colossus <laughs> machine. And undoubtedly, Turing played a very important part there. Uh, I think that the Colossus machine was indeed the world's first digital computer, but it relied entirely on valves, oh, yeah. enormous number of valves, mm. and, uh, countless valves. And I've, it was reconstructed in Bletchley yes. after the war, uh, after a long spell. And the people who reconstructed reconstructing were a wonderful team too. It was 2,000 valves as I remember yes. and, and uh, anyone who can remember a valve radio know that valves go and they break you all the time, all the time. Yes. so sure. almost always. Yes yeah. they were no good. Um, uh, we're very lucky us owners of iPads. <laughs> Let me just uh, jump cut as it were after the war I find you at St Anthony's part of a team of historians. Now this really fascinated me checking up the facts in, his, in Churchill's history of the English-speaking people. Now, very few historians who are politicians and ex-prime ministers, as he was at that point, uh, have the privilege of teams of historians to back him up. Well, I was very, very lucky to be involved with Churchill at that particular point. Uh, and uh, when, I've got, when I'd finished the work with him and I got a cheque for £200 uh, from him for the help I'd given him, uh, I hesitated for a very long time whether I should cash it. <laughs> uh, I decided I needed the money, therefore I did. <laughs> uh, but um, the point about the... I once had to tell Churchill that the account that he gave it was called the History of the English-Speaking Peoples. I had to tell him that the account that he gave of the formation of the American original constitution was too Marxist. Yes. Uh, and I found that really a delight to tell him. You, uh, but the thing about you Churchill... You must be the only man who told Churchill. No, no, no. Ch Ch <laughs> Churchill was, in fact, uh, a, a very good historian. Was this before his Missouri speech about the Iron Curtain? Uh, yes. So he knew uh, which side of that curtain... Uh, yes, he knew. He you must have confused uh, him. But he, was, he didn't want to talk too much about the Iron Curtain.
what he wanted to talk about was Britain before the Romans. Uh, and his own interests really were in very distant periods of history. He did have, of course, this team of pe people working with him. We never met together as a team. No. Stuff was sent to me. Uh, and I read it in a kind of pseudo proof. Uh, and then I sent back my own comments. Uh, and there was a man who became the first head of, uh, of St. Anthony's, Bill Deakin, who had been in Yugoslavia, and uh, whom I already knew. In SOE. And a marvellous person, mm -hmm. Bill. When, when St. Anthony's was opened, instead of drinking sherry or champagne to celebrate the only, we drank Simovitz. <laughs> and that was served all around. It, Bill Deakin was a wonderful person. So were, were you correcting Churchill's facts, as it were? Occasionally, that yes. Was, yeah. uh, mm. we, we, the, and there were factual errors because I, I've come to the conclusion in my life that teamwork is essential. It was essential at Bletchley, and it was also essential uh, in, his, in history. But I've never myself participated in any very, very strong historical team apart from that time back with mm. Churchill. I've been a very independent-minded historian. And there's a lot in my new book about history and the study of history as a subject. Uh, I've also not been too much tied to the study of history when I was Vice-Chancellor of Sussex. I spent more time on biological sciences than I did on history. Uh, and I was involved in the starting of what was called materials sciences, sciences at that stage. Let's talk about Sussex while Bletchley is still uh, fresh in our minds because this we're really looking back to about 1961. Yes. And you are devising what then became famously known as a map of learning. Yes. Um, what were your first moves in this? I mean, if um, I was asked to start a university. I think, well, what I'd do? I mean, where to begin? Well, I thought it was a, a quite exceptional privilege to be involved in starting a university. Uh, I wrote the map of learning as a lecture which I gave in Australia. And Australia has had a very big part to play in my own life. Um, I gave that lecture there, and then when I got back to England, I was asked to do it in all kinds of other places in slightly different forms. But I felt that uh, my own metaphors do tend to be geographical. Uh, I'm interested in maps. Uh, and I feel myself that um, when I was writing about the map of learning, I was thinking not only of the way in which way back in the 15th and 16th mm. century, in the course of the discoveries, we were creating a new map of the world. But I was thinking about the way in which subjects were related to each other. And um, I felt myself that the relationships were crucial and that we should provide a university education which would enable one to see how one subject was related to another. And I was most interested in what you said uh, about the uh, way in which those first-year subjects mattered. Mm. Um, the first-year subjects were supposed to introduce people to a map. And I believe that at the end of the day, when you finish your university education, you'll be able to bring them all together again and see how what you'd learnt in the course of your university experience. Uh, it was a great privilege to be there. and. Uh, we were the first of the new universities, and I got involved in uh, other ones too, uh, in the way I was the first person, for example, to be given a degree, an honorary degree at East Anglia. Uh, and Frank Thistlethwaite, oh, yes. I knew very well. Uh, and uh, I w I'd wanted to get Frank Thistlethwaite to succeed me at Leeds, but he had other things in mind. Uh, but it's interesting that, uh, at East Anglia, that got nearer to thinking in terms of uh, Sussex terms.
than any other new university. It had university. schools, not departments. It, was, it yeah. had schools. Yeah. And also, it had people like John Burrow, yeah. who were marvellous people, mm. a great historian, but also yeah. a man who saw the linkages. Now, what put, put John off East Anglia eventually to come to Sussex uh, was because he felt that East Anglia, he was tied to one particular school. Mm. And he wanted to be more involved in more than one school. Mm. Uh, and so he came to Sussex. He was not particularly happy, I should say, in Sussex. Uh, but it, nonetheless, he came and he was a very original mind uh, and a very, very good historian. I mean, the, when I look back on, on, on your map of learning as I experienced it, um, it was suffused <coughs> with the history of ideas. Yes. So, um, again, in that first year, I think Francis Bacon was very important, yes, Brown, yes. Thomas Brown uh, and Locke. Um, there were a lot of good philosophers. It's yes, there, was a, there may have been a bit too much philosophy. Um, uh, <laughs> they, uh, and then there was a course called uh, Darwin, Marx, Freud. Yes. Um, that was in I the school. I don't of remember kids, much so. Darwin. Um, yes. Uh, to my uh, res retrospective disappointment. Yes. I didn't really care at the time. Uh, um, we uh, studied a wonderful entity uh, called the Modern European Mind. Yes. Uh, which gave that all of us a, a chance. That was a very good course. That was a very good course. Was that you? No. No? No. Uh, that was really essentially Martin White ah, yes. who developed that mm. course. Uh, but it was a very good course. It's interesting that uh, I was taught not a thing about Freud when I was an undergraduate in mm. Cambridge. And I learnt about Freud for the first time in the United States, in Chicago, which was a great university and has figured very prominently in my own life. Uh, Chicago really taught Freud, and I learnt about Freud. Uh, I didn't really find Freud ultimately any more satisfactory to me than Marx. No. Uh, well, not a scientist. Yes. Maybe more a poet. Yes. Because certainly uh, I seem to remember being encouraged by Lawrence Lerner to read yes, right. Future of an Illusion and Civilization and its Discontents. Yes. And those were the first truly positively atheistic books yes. that I read, and they made a big impression on me. Um, Kafka loomed hugely, yes. uh, so I felt all the time that I, I was there meant to be doing English literature, um, but in fact uh, read an enormous amount around the generation sure. of Kafka, including Bruno Schultz and others, and Thomas Mann, of course. Um, so anyway, thank you for that. I really enjoyed my three years. <coughs> But just link it again, just to go back to Bletchley and Sussex yes. and the Open University, because I think they all yes, sure. are part of something that uh, both shaped you and then you gave back. <coughs> you see, I decided myself that um, I would write this book, the second of the books, uh, about the way in which my own rather unconventional views still about history uh, really do relate to the rest of my, the 88 years I didn't spend at Bletchley. Um, the, uh, I found that um, the interesting thing about Sussex was that we were breaking down uh, boundaries. Uh, the art science scheme was very close to my own heart. Uh, we were trying to produce people who would be able to cope with a different kind of future from that which they were living through then. Uh, and therefore, to my mind, the future was part of the pattern. Uh, but it's certainly the case that Bletchley uh, gave me a feeling that um, we were not going to be there forever where, and when I left Sussex and went back to Oxford, which was an unusual thing to do, which I never expected to do, when I went back to Oxford, I uh, found myself in a college which, after Sussex, uh, was really 
in some ways very unsatisfactory. Mm. Uh, first of all, I could never get my own way uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, in Sussex. Uh, difficult the times were. I found it really on the whole not too difficult to find a vice chancellor that I could really ultimately be listened to. Nobody showed the slightest interest when I got back to Oxford in what I'd been doing at Sussex. Not a thing. I was never asked one question about Sussex. And when I suggested once that uh, they, instead of actually trying to start Russian in uh, the college, they ought to send people to Birmingham for a year. They thought that was even more dangerous than sending them to Sussex. Uh, um, I can't believe that an, uh, we're almost at the time where we must throw this open. I have one final question because I can't let you go without touching. I mean, there's, there's all of Victorian England to discuss, but we have no time. Uh, but you wrote a five-volume history of broadcasting, and you're the only person we know who knew Reef. Yes. Um, and could you just reflect on him? Uh, I mean, he comes to mind because uh, you talk of not getting your own way. Well, he was a man who generally did get his own way. He was very, to me, uh, I said when I was asked if I'd write the history of the BBC, uh, a, a history, I insisted it should be called a history of broadcasting in the United Kingdom. When I started writing it, the Director General of the BBC then was on such awful terms with Reith that he couldn't even talk to him. And uh, I said to him, I can't really write about the beginnings of the BBC without really dealing with Reith. So I went to London and I gave Reith lunch in my club in London at that time. And Reith uh, drank a glass of sherry, which he was supposed never to do, uh, and at that stage. And I gave him a good lunch and I paid for it. And then he stood on the steps of the club, looking towering down above me. And he said to me, Professor Briggs, if I had thought that you would ever suggest that I should help you, I was very uncertain whether I'd do so. But I'll tell you this, that if you'd written your letter to me on BBC notepaper, I would have cast it into the flames. <laughs> Uh, and I got on very well with Reith. Reith never made the slightest attempt, and Reith had got serious weaknesses. But nonetheless, Reith never made the slightest attempt, paid the slightest attention to uh, correcting what I'd said. He would say, "Just think about that perhaps a little bit differently." That was as far as he'd ever go. He also appropriately lived in Lollard's Tower. Uh, in the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury's London residence, so that I felt there was a particular kind of attraction in slipping into Lollard's Tower. And since he produced this enormous diary, he would leave the diary open at a page which he particularly wanted me to read. Yeah. But he would never say, read it. Uh. I'm going to now open this out to um, everyone else to have a go at asking a question or two, um, there's a roving mic. It'd um, be helpful if you stood when you asked a question so we can all see you. And maybe there are some house lights too that would also... Yes, thank you. <coughs> Professor Briggs, I took a degree with the Open University a few years ago and it changed my life. I'm just so grateful. I wish you'd say a few words about how it came about. Yes. I wasn't aware, actually, that you were one of the founders. Thank you. I, I was on the original planning committee, uh, which had the task of really working out our ideas about the curriculum of the Open University. <coughs> and the one thing we were determined not to do was to overplan it. We were waiting for the people to come and do that themselves. But I was involved in some of the first course teams. And then that was stage one, if you like, in my own um, life as uh, 
at the Open University as a, in the planning committee. And I'm very glad to see I was looking through the list of people to whom Sussex had given honorary degrees that we did give an honorary degree to Peter Venables, who was the chairman of that planning committee, which was chosen by Jenny Lee. Uh, then I went back to the Open University as chancellor. And I was chancellor of the Open University from 1978 to 1994. It's a long time. And then I was trying to work out ways in which the Open University could adapt itself to changing times and changing technology. I was deeply interested in the convergence of technical change and demands for increased education opportunity. And I do regard the work that I did for the Open University as being of great importance to me. Uh, I was doing that while I was uh, at Sussex. And uh, we had had 10 years of student life at Sussex, new student life at Sussex, when in fact the Open University took in its first students. And some of those students I got to know very well. And I, I, it seemed to me that it's one of the things I'm most proud of in my life, in having been involved in these two new institutions. Because we're not terribly good in this country in producing new places that really matter. And I think both of them thought things out for themselves. I've got a question down here. In the early, early 90s, I studied history at Sussex University. To my great regret, I missed you. But I had the great luck of being taught by John Burrow. Yes. And one day I asked him, John, why actually have you specialized on the Victorian era? Yes. Is it possible that you thought that you might find in the 19th century the keys which might enable you to explain the 20th century? And John would reply, well, initially I thought so. What would your answer be? <laughs> well, I've, I think John is a marvelous historian on the 19th century. I rate him very, very highly. <laughs> Everything he writes uh, is something which I've, he wrote, is something which I found most illuminating. But I think I was probably more interested in the 20th century as well as the 19th. I've never believed I've been tied to one period of history. If people say, what period of history are you interested in? I say, I'm interested in history. Uh, John was rather uh, not particularly interested in 20th century history. And when, sadly for him, I think, he went to Oxford himself, uh, to Baylor College, he didn't find that it was very congenial to him because people were not as much interested in the Victorians as he was. Uh, I'm interested, could you tell us a little about exactly how you were recruited to Bletchley Park? Uh, did, did you have any inkling of what you were getting into? And did you have any option in the matter? Oh yes, I had option. Uh, I was originally going to go to work in radar. Uh, and it, because the physics tutor in my college thought that you could, could convert historians into scientists for the duration of the war. Um, I, uh, I didn't ever get called up into radar because radar worked very well without me. Uh, but I was interviewed by C.P. Snow. Uh, and C.P. Snow, on a very, very sort of grey uh, Cambridge uh, autumn afternoon, and C.P. Snow decided he would put me into something which would be involved with science. Uh, and, but I never got called up into radar, so I made my own way to Bletchley by a somewhat circuitous route, as I've said, through signals. 
I was in Singh's Corps. And uh, when I was forced to change from the Singh's Corps to the Intelligence Corps, I regretted it. I liked to be called Signalman at that time. Um, however, uh, once uh, I went to Bletchley, I had to do a course uh, on uh, cryptography, uh, and we did nothing at all in that course, which is held in Bedford, uh, on any machine cryptography. We were breaking the Spanish Armada code, in effect. Uh, we were dealing with cryptography before the age of the machine, when it was really, really considerable art. Uh, from there, I went directly into Bletchley uh, because I was lucky enough that my another tutor, the maths tutor in my own college, uh, who didn't, want to, didn't take me to Bletchley earlier, as he took many people, um, he was, wanted me to be with him. So once I got to Bletchley, uh, I went into Hut 6, largely because of Gordon Welshman, who was a very different person from Turing. Turing was a brilliant mind. John, uh, to, uh, the, uh, as far as, as, uh, uh, as the people, Gordon Welshman was concerned, and somebody who's writing his biography, uh, Gordon Welshman devised the system-breaking aspect and the role of the huts uh, at Bletchley. So I would then worked entirely in Hut 6, the watch, until the end of the war. But it was by a circuitous route where some people, like John Herrigal, who I mentioned earlier, went straight to Bletchley from the college. And Sydney was a remarkable college because it produced no fewer than 10 people who were working at the heights of crypt cryptanalysis in, 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 in Bletchley. But it was not by that route that I got there. There's a gentleman at the back. <laughs> Lord Briggs, you um, commented particularly on the very favourable organisational tone, for want of a better phrase, at Bletchley Park during the war. Yes. Um, and how immensely successful this organisation was, as the results obviously show. Do you attribute this to the then leadership at the time, or was it a little bit, you know, people like, was he Commander Alistair Denniston and people like that, and Dilwyn Knox and those sort of people? Or well, was Bletchley it more serendipitous, something yes. more accidental, perhaps? You see, I think Bletchley was... No two years at Bletchley were the same, any more than two years in the early years of the opening of Sussex were the same. Um, Denison was, in effect, deposed. Uh, and uh, I knew uh, Denison not well, uh, and I liked him. Uh, and, of course, I followed all the Denison connections later. Uh, he went then to break diplomatic codes in London. Uh, the person then who took over uh, was uh, a man who uh, had none of the uh, uh, great skills uh, uh, at Bletchley, uh, Travis, uh, but he was a very, very good organiser and he knew how to get money out of church. <laughs> um, I, I admired Travis immensely. But the person I admired most at Bletchley, apart from Turing, a different way, was Brigadier Tiltman, who was the head of the army at Bletchley, a wonderful person, totally helpful in every way. And he was a man who had broken codes all over the world before the war. And uh, he, uh, he was a genuinely uh, brilliant cryptographer. And again, Tiltman has never had the praise given to him that he should have. Thank you very much. We've got time for one more question. Yep. 
you worry me, what you said about our politicians not knowing anything about history. And, I mean, how would you see, uh, the, say, Europe in 10 years' time from your knowledge of how history has played out in the past, and are there any parallels? I don't really think, on the whole, that uh, history can be too much involved in prediction. Uh, it can look ahead and see what it would judge the likely changing balance of forces. Um, I find it very, very difficult to uh, say what Europe will be like in another 10 years' time, or even what it will be like next year. Um, I think that um, you don't need to be a historian to be really uh, able to consider the future of Europe. You've got to look at it through so many kind of ways, including particularly, of course, economics. Um, I believe that the person who knows most history in the present government and has written two books about it is, of course, Hague. Uh, and I don't know that that would necessarily make him a better politician. But he certainly does know more about history than anybody else. And the, 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 the way out of knowing about history was Blair. He knew nothing about history either. Uh, but between them, uh, we've never been quite to be in this position before. I think that when I was listening, for example, to watching a program last night, by Rory Stewart on Afghanistan. He does know his history, and he knows what Afghanistan is like now. And therefore, I would tend to put my trust in a person who has had some experience of history in the making, but also has got the capacity to judge what the changing balance of forces will be and a sense of perspective. But I certainly couldn't predict history uh, as it will be, uh, Europe as it will be in 50 years' time. My guess it will be very different from what it is now. Well, when a man enters his 10th uh, decade and uh, publishes two remarkable and stimulating volumes, such as are on sale right now uh, in the bookshop, uh, you know you are in the presence of uh, a true intellectual force. And it's, a, it's been a great privilege to hear your reflections. Thank you very much. Great privilege. Sir.